Dear brothers and sisters, as we go into these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah, a lot of the focus and attention will naturally be on Ibrahim alayhi salam, on Abraham, peace be upon him. And he is in the Quran, Ibrahim. He is in some of the Qiraat, Abraham. He is an amazing figure, one who we take our ritual from, our deen from, the great grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, who resembled the Prophet ﷺ most, and the Prophet Prophet's way resembles his way the most. This is Milla ta Abikum Ibrahim. This is the way of your father Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Hajj is a commemoration of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When you pray, you mention Ibrahim alayhi salam in every single salah. We honor this man in so many different ways. And there's something about that that I want to focus on. Had it not been for the tests and trials that Ibrahim alayhi salam endured and the way that he endured them, Many of the reasons that he is celebrated for would not exist in the Qur'an and in our history. Let me repeat that in a different way. As Ibrahim salam was going through his trials, not only did he bear his trials with such patience and such nobility and sidq and truth and this loyalty and, and you know, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he went through those trials, those trials became the means by which he was elevated, became the stories that we tell that are in fact the reasons that he is honored. He is first honored by revelation and by being Abu al-Anbiya, the father of the prophets, and a person who did much good. But if you look through his life, much like many of the prophets that we find in the Qur'an, the reasons for his honor trace back to his most his most difficult moments, his lowest points, and how in his lowest points he had the highest iman and faith. And that's why we celebrate him. Those are the stories that are told in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the thing about Ibrahim ﷺ is that everyone in his family has a perspective. And all of them have a very similar story of tribulation and trial that is unique to them, but it all comes together to make this beautiful family. So from the perspective of Ibrahim salam, you have a prophet that is rejected by his people, rejected by even his father, despite being the most eloquent of the prophets, as Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentioned, Afsahul al-anbiya, despite being able to articulate intelligent arguments, despite the reputation he had with his people, he leaves his people, rejected by every single person in the town, except for his wife, Sarah. The perspective of Sarah, and the ending was not pretty. The ending is him being thrown in, stripped down and thrown into a fire. And Allah protecting him from the burning of that fire, but the pain of being stripped down by your father and thrown into a fire in front of the people, that doesn't depart by the fire being made cool for Ibrahim salam. That's painful. And only having your wife Sarah to travel with you outside of that place. There's the perspective of Sarah being married to Ibrahim alayhi salam, being his only follower in his town, being childless in that situation with no sight of anyone that would that would that would take over after they depart from this world, that would inherit the prophethood of Ibrahim alayhi salam late into their age. They didn't leave. Haran when they were young. They left after many decades of humiliation and struggle. And they start to make this journey. And then the other people start to become a part of the story. Each one of them having a very unique perspective and one that requires a lot of patience and trial and tribulation. Then comes Hajar. Then comes Ismail. Then comes Ishaq. Then comes Ya'qub and Yusuf. It's a legacy of tribulation and patience shown in that tribulation as each one of them goes through a different struggle that is unique to them but completes this family of sidq, of truthfulness and patience. And so I want to actually view the story of Ibrahim salam today from the perspective of Hajar. Hajar is a very unique person in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Her intervention into the story is so different. Most of the time, when you look through the stories of the prophets, you see that the believers themselves, the prophets themselves, 
are rejected and then end up in a situation where they are hostage to an oppressor. Like Yusuf alayhi salam, going from being the favorite son to being a slave and a prisoner. Most of the time, the Prophet is put at the mercy of someone else. Hajar's story is very different. She has the opposite cycle. She is put at the mercy of a Prophet and his wife, and then put into the spiral of uncertainty, and has to figure it out along the way, in a very unique way to her perspective, and in a way that we can all take lessons of conviction and certainty in times of deep uncertainty. So where does this woman come from and what is her legacy? And what is her perspective in this entire story and her intervention into this legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam? The ending of it is at no point on these 24 hours, on any day of the year, is she not being honored and celebrated in Sa'i. This woman who could have died rejected and forgotten, instead is honored like no other woman in history, with people constantly commemorating her patience and her ritual all the time. Tell me when you could go to Sa'i and not find someone doing that. The legacy is the Prophet ﷺ telling his followers that one day you're going to go to a place called Masr, Egypt, and treat the people with a special type of love because they are the descendants of our mother, Umm Ismail, Hajar, alayhi salam. So they're special people because they descend from the same special woman that I descended from. This is a woman from Masr. How does she come into the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ibrahim is traveling with his wife Sarah to find a new place to settle and to give da'wah. Sarah is a righteous woman. And as Sarah goes with Ibrahim alayhi salam, they pass through Masr and there is a pharaoh in Masr, a tyrant, and this is a long hadith in Al-Bukhari that explains the story, this tyrant, this pharaoh in Masr that takes two attractive women, kills their husbands, and takes them for himself. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was asked about her, he said, she is my sister. He was not lying because she is his sister in faith. And the Pharaoh called Sarah because she was a beautiful woman. And he took Sarah into his palace and he began to approach her. Sarah made wudu as she was taken into the palace of this Pharaoh. And as the man started to approach her, she called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a beautiful dua. She said, Oh Allah, if you know that I followed you and your messenger only in obedience and in accordance with the truth, meaning I'm not just a believer because I'm married to Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know that I am a mu'mina. You know that I'm a believer that was willing to take on the struggles in my unique way. If you know that I was truthful in following your messenger, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and in abiding by the truth, then protect me from this man. As he started to approach her and she made that dua, he was overcome by a temporary paralysis. He froze. And something started to happen to his body. And then she said, Oh Allah, if he dies, the people will say that I killed him and then they'll kill me. So don't let him die. Just hold him back from me. So he's stuck and he can't touch her. But he's not dying because Sarah is saying, don't let him die because if the people walk in and I'm here and there's a dead Pharaoh, then that's the end of me and my husband. So then he unfroze, he regained his ability. He started to approach her again. She made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a second time and it happened to him again, except this time his shaking became more severe. And so she said, oh Allah, if he dies, people will say I killed him. So don't let him die, just protect me from his harm. So Allah protected her again. Third time, he comes at her again with the same thing. He's not learning his lesson. She made dua against him again. And the shaking became more severe. She said, oh Allah, don't kill him because the people will say that I killed him. And then they'll come for me and my husband. Instead, what happened is when he came out of it the third time, he called his guards. He says, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْتُمْ إِلَيَّ shaytana. You sent a devil to me. This woman is not a normal woman. She's a jinn. She's a devil. He said, so get rid of her and give her ajr. 
Give her a compensation. Send someone with her to get her away from me so she doesn't harm me. He became afraid of her harm. Said, get her away and give her something too. The Ajr was Hajar. Was a slave girl named Hajar. Now, her name is not actually Hajar. She, Ajr just means a compensation, a reward. Hajar literally means Ha Ajruki. Here is your reward. So Hajar means your reward. So he said, take her and you and you and your brother leave, get out of here, please. No harm intended and no harm reciprocated. Just leave. So she smiled and she said, Allah protected me. Allah protected me from the tyrant and gifted me with Hajar. So they took Hajar with them. Hajar is not a believer yet. This is not the story of a prophet being taken as a slave. This is a story of a woman that was in the house of the Pharaoh, serving the Pharaoh, like Asiya, but under very different circumstances. She's not the, the wife of the Pharaoh, she's just a servant girl in the palace of the Pharaoh, has no idea who Ibrahim is. For all she knows, Sarah could indeed be the shaytana, the demon that the Pharaoh thinks she is. So it says, take her with you. So they travel with Hajar. Hajar observes the Iman, the belief of Ibrahim السلام, and Sarah. Hajar becomes a believer by witnessing it. And just like Sarah was truthful in her Iman, Hajar was truthful in her Iman. Sarah goes from being the servant of the Pharaoh to being transferred as a servant in the household of a prophet to now being married to a prophet. Ibrahim alayhi salam takes her as a wife. She gives birth to Ismail. She's a believing woman now. Look at the change of her status. Look at the change of her status. How many more women were there in the palace of the Fir'aun? But Allah chose her for this remarkable journey to be brought in in this way. And she has a child, Ismail. Ibrahim and Sarah had not been able to conceive for all of these years and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them Ismail. Now, this is where if you start to read narrations and stories and things start to come into play, you can misconstrue the situation because the next part of the story is that someone would say that Sarah said, get rid of her, take her to the furthest desert and abandon her over there. That is not the Islamic conception of the story. Yes, Sarah had ghira then, she was jealous of Hajar, but Ibrahim alayhi salam would not go and abandon Hajar and, his, and her child and his child because Sarah asked him to do so. And we'll know this later on in the story from a very direct question. Did Allah command you to do this? So Ibrahim alayhi salam takes Hajar, this believing woman, and her son Ismail. And he takes her to Mecca and the child to Mecca. At that time, the Kaaba is buried under the dirt, under the sand. The foundations of the Kaaba that Ibrahim السلام, would be told one day to raise. It's there, but it's buried under the sand. The foundations of the Kaaba are there. Ibrahim السلام, knows he's in sacred territory. He knows that in this vicinity, there's Baytullah al-Haram, there's the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where, when Ibrahim alayhi salam doesn't ask questions. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلَمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah tells him, submit, he says, I submit. He doesn't ask more questions, he just goes with it. And he takes Hajar as commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ismail to Mecca. Crude mountains, hot deserts, no water, no buildings. No tribe to settle it. And Ibrahim alayhi salam sets up a little area for them, leaves them with some dates, a little bit of water, and in great sadness, Ibrahim alayhi salam starts to walk away. Imagine how painful this was for Ibrahim alayhi salam. All the du'as he had made for a child, and you got to leave him in a desert. He would not have his haq for 13 years, by the way. So it wasn't even like immediately the response came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He came home and he had a child through Sarah and Ishaq. No, 13 years, over a decade. 
before he would have another child after he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of these years and now you have to walk away from Hajar and Ismail Ibrahim alayhi salam as he's walking away Hajar like any woman would do any human being would do she says what are you doing are you going to leave me here fi wadin ghayra dhi zar'in in a place where there's no fruit, no vegetation, no water. What am I doing here? What's going to happen? Ibrahim alayhi salam is overwhelmed with emotion and he can't answer her. And then Hajar says to him, Allahu amaraka bihada. Did Allah command you to do this? Did Allah command you to do this? Ibrahim alayhi salam signifies yes nods his head or points or gives her the signal that yes, this is Allah commanding me to do this. I'm not doing this out of my own desire. This is Allah's command. Hajar at that point does not say to him, well in that case at least do this, do this, this and that, fine I'll forgive it, you can go, but make sure you do this, this, this and that first. Hajar at that point with full conviction Full certainty. She says, Idan la Allah. She said, then Allah is not going to lose his people. I'm not worried then. Complete sakina, complete trust, complete tranquility. Imagine this situation here. She's gonna be left in the desert with a baby, no one around her, but she says Allah does not lose his people. Ibrahim alayhi salam walks away with great sadness as he disappears from her sight. This is where many of the ulama say this is exactly where. Imagine the moment of Ibrahim alayhi salam now behind the mountain where he turns back and he can't see his wife and his child anymore. And he says, Rabbi inni askantu dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zar'an inda baytika al muharram. Oh my Lord, I've left my family there around your sacred home. Again. It wasn't built yet, raised, he doesn't know where, but it's somewhere here. I've left them here, O oh Allah, in a place where there's no vegetation, where there's nothing to even physically sustain them. رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ O oh Allah, allow them first and foremost to be sound in their faith. Let them establish the prayer. And then he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَجَعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ let some, the hearts of people come towards them. Let them incline towards them. Now sometimes the dua is so sincere and Allah accepts the dua in a way that you can't even imagine. Because Ibrahim alayhi salam in saying that perhaps it's just the tribes. Let the tribes find him. Let, 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 the, let the people find them and take care of them. But Ibrahim alayhi salam would have never imagined this level of honor that she has in the hearts of people that we are commemorating her how many thousands of years later and celebrating her and celebrating her great grandson Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the way that we do وَرَزُقُهُ مِنَ thamarat and let them have some fruits, let them have some, some sustenance as well so provide for them O oh Allah now subhanAllah as this happens now we know later on in the story the tribe of Jurham will, will come. A tribe will see that there are some birds flying around and they will know that there is water. Later on in the story the, the tribes come, they settle. They end up with a, with a civilization, a small civilization around them. But at this moment, dear brothers and sisters, Hajar, when she says Allah will not let us go to waste, Allah does not lose his people. At this moment when Hajar goes back, Hajar is demonstrating and encompassing some of the most beautiful ayat, the most beautiful verses about what it means to trust in moments of uncertainty. Hajar is demonstrating what the Prophet ﷺ said, Ana inda dhanna abdi bi. I am what my servant expects of me. I am what my servant expects of me. You expect good from Allah, Allah will give you good. So when she calls out and she says, that Allah will not let us go to waste, Allah does not lose his people, that is, ana inda dhanna abdi bi, demonstrated, I am what my servant expects of me, husna dhan in Allah, good expectation of Allah. Second thing is this, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ The one who's conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will always make a way out for them and provide for them in ways that they never would have imagined 
or experienced. When she goes back now, and she's looking at her baby, and the sun is getting hotter, and she has no water, and there is nothing coming from sight, and she's there standing next to a safa, looking around, running around for her baby, and at no point questioning her faith, at no point calling out to Allah like, Oh Allah, enough! Completely certain that Allah is going to provide for her. And the Prophet ﷺ says, as he's running around looking from mountain to mountain, imagine no one in Mecca, no buildings in Mecca, no tribes in Mecca, it's a hard sight to imagine, going from mountain to mountaintop, calling out, seeing if there is even a distant traveler. She raises her head, فَإِذَا Jibril. She sees Jibreel alayhi salam. And Jibreel alayhi salam simply strikes the ground with his heel. And Zamzam starts to pop out. He struck it so deep that we're still drinking from that strike today. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, Rahim Allah um Ismail, may Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail. Because when the water started coming out, she was afraid that it, would, that it would come out, burst out, and then it would dry up on the surface. So she carved out the area of Zamzam to contain the water and said, had she not done that, Zamzam would have touched every part of the earth. And may Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail. She carves it out, she drinks from that water, and she starts to suckle her son Ismail. Complete confidence and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Jurhum sees the, the birds flying around and they say, well, where birds fly around, there must be water. So they start to settle around her. They ask permission to settle around her in Zamzam. And the rest of the story is as we know it, that history. But dear brothers and sisters, I want you to connect yourself to the story for a moment through the perspective of Hajar alayhi salam and what she went through in that moment, how she is honored. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam thousands of years later would stand on Safa. And by the way, Zamzam is right next to Safa. It's closer to Safa than it, way closer to Safa than it is to Marwa. The Prophet ﷺ with thousands of years later, her great, 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 great grandson would stand on that same mountain of Safa. And he would call out to the people to believe. And all of the people that he thought loved him, turned their backs on him and walked away. Imagine that painful moment of the Prophet ﷺ standing on Safa. That type of loneliness is different. He calls out to them and says, If I was to tell you there's an army on the other side, would you believe me? He said, Of course, you're a Sadiq al Amin, the trustworthy, the truthful. We always believe you, O Messenger of Allah. You never lie to us. And then he says that I'm a Messenger of Allah, and they turn away from him. His uncle curses him, mocks him, and they turn away from him and the Prophet ﷺ is standing alone on Safa and watching everyone turn their backs on him and walk away. This is not Ibrahim ﷺ turning his back and walking away from Hajar ﷺ out of the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But think about him standing in that spot and watching the people turn their backs on him in the same place that Hajar was left completely alone thousands of years later. And then the Prophet ﷺ triumphs. Two decades later, he comes back and he stands on Safa again. And this time, thousands and thousands and thousands of believers around him, surrounding him, as he stands on a Safa. And the Prophet ﷺ remembers, I stood in this spot 20 years ago and everyone turned their back on me. But here I am now, and there are thousands of believers from all over, not just the people of Mecca, the people of Medina, and all over, Salman, Al-Farisi, Suhaib, Al-Rumi, people from all over the world sitting in front of him. And the Prophet ﷺ being reminded by Allah as he reminds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that so long as you have that certainty in Allah, that it doesn't matter what your circumstances are, Allah does not lose his people. Allah does not lose sight of His people. Allah does not let the reward of His people go to waste. Allah does not let His people in despair. Allah does not lose His people. The Prophet ﷺ had to go through that moment of lowness to be celebrated in that moment of highness. 
The Prophet ﷺ was humbled in that moment, his head down, asking the people, did I deliver the message to you properly? Asking Allah, Allah manni balakht, Allah ma fashhad, oh Allah, I delivered the message, oh Allah, bear witness to it. But he had to go through that moment of, of hardship to really appreciate that moment that he was in now. And guess what? When we go there and we do Safa and Marwa and Sa'i, you know what we say? The Prophet ﷺ made one dua as he would go through. The du'a between Safa and Marwa is all from your heart, in your language, whatever you want to say. But the one prescribed du'a, the Prophet ﷺ says, at Safa and Marwa, every time, and teaches us to say, La ilaha illallah wahda, anjaza wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa hazam al ahzaba wahda. There is no God but Allah alone. Anjaza wa'da, he fulfilled his promise to Hajar and to the Prophet. ﷺ. And to Ismail to make of him a great nation. And he fulfilled his promise to the Prophet ﷺ to support him and to make of him a great nation. And he supported his servant. He gave victory to his servant. When everyone else turned away and it was only Allah, Allah gave victory to his servants. And Allah alone destroyed all of those that sought to oppress the Prophet ﷺ, that came from all regions to oppress him. Instead, Allah brought believers to him from every direction. Dear brothers and sisters, the lesson from all of these prophets, the lesson from all of these stories and all of these perspectives, is that if Allah has you under his control and his protection, whether you're standing on a mountain or you're sent into a sea, whether you're in a palace or you're in a desert, the same circumstances matter nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not let his people in loss. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on our mother Hajar, send his peace and blessings upon our father Ibrahim alayhi salam and our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and grant us those same characteristics and traits and allow us to shine in our darkest moments so that our highest moments are actually in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us when we question and see us through every difficulty. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li sa'al muslimin. Fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafur rahim.